Hi learners, it's M from Sound Nerds, and this video is on Unit 25, New Considerations. Unit 25, New Considerations. When an instructor or an author builds their content, it's a fine balance of including enough information for you to understand concepts, but not so much that it gets to be an information overload. Now my goal throughout this physics series was to use the major textbooks currently available and combine their information into a resource that prepared you well for the ARDMS Sonographic Principles and Instrumentation Board Exam. Units 1 through 24 are solid physics concepts that will be on your SBI test, but as the field evolves, so do the technologies and therefore the exams that test your knowledge. In this unit, I've decided to include some new technologies that may be on your exam, a little bit more bits of information that might be helpful, and lastly, some advice in preparing for the SPI examination. The content presented in this last unit is subject to change, but everything to my knowledge is current as of March of 2022. I will update this lecture as major changes occur in our very exciting world of sonography. Section 25.1, New Technologies. Ultrasound equipment manufacturers are always looking for new ways to improve ultrasound imaging and how it's used in patient care. In Unit 15A, we discuss some of those newer technologies, including elastography and strain, but there are even more technologies starting to emerge. This section is meant to be an overview of the technologies and not an in-depth look as the science behind them won't be tested on the SPI, but it's good to recognize what the technologies are and what they contribute to ultrasound. Fusion imaging allows the practitioner to simultaneously display a stored CT or MRI image with a live ultrasound image. Through tracking technology, the stored CT or MRI will automatically align with where the transducer is moved on the patient. This is extremely useful with a lesion that is better seen on CT or MRI, but ultrasound is a safer way to perform a biopsy of the lesion. This video is linked in the workbook if you would like to hear the audio and see the full video on YouTube. Intravascular imaging, or IVIS, uses a very small probe that can be inserted into a vessel. It gives a 360 degree view of the inside, which can be helpful for a 2D assessment for plaque or stenosis in a vessel. In the images here, we can see two examples of the IVIS catheters. Again, these are inserted into a vessel. The actual transducer part is this very tiny part here on this one, little part here on this one, and it's actually rotated to create an image that creates that 360 degree view. This is the inside of the vessel. This is the wall or the intima of the vessel here, and we can see the plaque formation starting to build. Tissue Doppler imaging, also known as TDI, is specifically used for cardiac imaging. Just like we can use Doppler to detect motion of blood, we can use Doppler to detect motion of the heart wall. Typically when using color Doppler for blood, we filter out those low velocity information because we only want the information from the faster movement of the blood. With TDI, the machine uses what we call a high pass filter, which will filter out the high velocities and then leave the low velocities of the heart wall motion. Color then is assigned to the movement on the walls. We talked about this briefly when talking about cardiac strain, but this has a very particular name to it. Again, it's the tissue Doppler imaging. A gate then can be placed on the wall and we can get a spectral tracing of how the wall is moving over time. So anytime that you see color on a cardiac image appearing to be color on the walls, immediately think tissue Doppler and cardiac strain. Ultrasound is fast becoming an effective method to evaluate the muscles, tendons, and ligaments in the body. This is known as MSK or musculoskeletal ultrasound, but MRI remains the gold standard for evaluating these structures. MSK ultrasound is still a very specialized exam and many sonographers are not proficient in it, but more and more radiologists and sonographers are learning and expanding the subspecialty of ultrasound. Now the whole reason that I bring up MSK during the physics lecture is that there is an acoustic artifact that is very particular to MSK. It is anisotropy. And this is an artifact that means depending on the angle you're imaging a structure, the appearance of the returning echoes will change. 
So if we think about imaging the heart or imaging the liver, no matter what angle we come at, the walls are going to look a certain way, the chambers look a certain way, and the liver has its own echo pattern no matter how we come at it. But anisotropic structures look different depending on if you are at that preferred 90 degrees to the structure or angled to the structure. So again, anisotropy is an artifact that occurs based on how the sound is angled to the structure. So in our examples here, we have sound coming in at 81 degrees, and this is kind of the area that we're focusing at. We can't really see what the structure is. We can't evaluate it. Increase the angle a little bit more. We start to get a little bit more definition, even a little bit more as we get closer to that 90 degrees. And for MSK, 90 degrees is preferable because we get the best imaging of a lot of these structures, including the ligaments and tendons. So here we can see a very nice, well-defined structure. This is the preferred method. But these different views tell us that this structure is an anisotropic structure because it takes on a different appearance based on the angulation of sound. This is another video that is linked in your workbook. You will be able to watch the whole video with the sound on if you so choose. However, it is talking about high intensity focus ultrasound. High intensity focus ultrasound or HIFU, also known as focus ultrasound, FUS, encourages the use of ultrasound for its related bio effects. The beam or beams of ultra powerful sound waves are focused to produce thermal and or cavitational effects. FUS is not used for imaging. There are multiple goals associated with FUS. It can be used to heat muscles and tissue, having a therapeutic effect, or even a cosmetic effect. It can be used to destroy unwanted tissue like cancers and other lesions, or it can be used to deliver medication to a very specific part of the body. MRI and imaging ultrasound can both be used to guide where the FUS beams are placed. It is being studied quite heavily in its effectiveness in treating neurological conditions like tremors, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and more. It is an effective way to have surgery without cutting. In a moment here, we'll get to a part of the video in which the patient is having a hard time drinking from a cup of water. And then after, oh, here it is. After the uh, procedure, the patient's tremors are completely gone. So this is a really neat use of ultrasound, not quite the way that we use it in diagnostic medical sonography, but still an interesting use of ultrasound. Section 25.2, basic machine tools. There are some basic machine tools and methodology that isn't physics-based, but may be helpful for you to know for your exam. First, let's take a look at a few of the measurements that we can take with our machine. When placed on a B-mode image, calipers can measure how deep a structure is, measure the length, the width, or the height of a structure, measure the circumference of a structure, measure the area of a structure, and even calculate the volume of structures. When placed on a spectral tracing, calipers can measure velocities. So we have the peak systolic velocity. We can measure the end diastolic velocity. By measuring those, then it can calculate the resistive index. And we can also measure the acceleration time, which is the time it takes to go from end diastolic velocity to the peak systolic velocity. Now there's tons of other things that we can measure in the spectral tracing, but those are kind of the three basic information items that we want when doing basic ultrasound. When we place calipers on an M-mode image, we can also measure quite a few things like the distance of motion. We can measure the length, width, or height of things within this tracing. And then we can also measure a heart rate. So speaking of measuring length, width, or height, when we are measuring on a B-mode image, length is usually seen at the longest axis of the organ. Once we've determined the long axis of the organ, what we'll see then is that the width is 90 degrees to the long axis. Height then is measured from the anterior to posterior dimension. So height is sometimes also called the AP measurement, and that is going to be perpendicular to your length or perpendicular to your width no matter which direction you take it in, you should be getting the same value for your AP. CINE is another feature of modern ultrasound machines where the machine will store a bunch of images. You can then CINE back and look at the frames. 
You can also save the CINE as a CINE clip. So this means that CINE is a post-processing function. Now the CINE feature is helpful when there are moving structures and you saw what you needed right before freezing or you want to show the motion of those structures. CINE clips are commonly used in echocardiography in lieu of taking still images. It's more diagnostic to show the cardiologist the motion of the heart rather than just a still picture of it. CINE clips are often used in general ultrasound as well to show what the live scanning of pathology might look like and help the radiologist make a better diagnosis. However, you want to be very careful to not take too many CINE clips. There are over 100 images in each clip, and those tend to take up a lot of space in the PAC system. Now, CINE clips can be set as retrospective, which means you're capturing a clip up until the image was frozen. For example, the last three seconds of live imaging. Or they can be set up to be prospective, in which they will capture the next frames generated. For example, you could say you want the next three seconds of live imaging. So again, retrospective is taking a CINE clip of what you already saw, where prospective is going to be taking a CINE clip of what you're going to see. Sweep speed is another tool on your machine that you may want to use when you're using M mode or spectral Doppler. As the M mode window and the Doppler window refresh, time is going to go by at a certain speed, and this is called your sweep speed. So you can change how fast or slow the machine displays information in the window by changing the sweep speed. So you can see here that they are changing the sweep speed. As they increase it or decrease it, more spectral phases are displayed or less spectral phases are displayed. Section 25.3, Waveform Anatomy. Now some of these terms we did discuss in the Doppler section, but they are not necessary to understanding Doppler physics. Doppler physics is going to focus on just that, Doppler physics. So you shouldn't have questions about the waveform anatomy as this is more specific to vascular and echocardiography. However, when discussing Doppler, parts of the spectral waveform do have names and patterns that we recognize and are often used. Arterial waveforms tend to come in three variations, the triphasic, biphasic, and monophasic waveform. The triphasic waveform has a portion that is above, below, and above again, so it has three phases, above, below, above. Biphasic, then, is a waveform that only has two phases, a above the baseline and a below the baseline. Monophasic then tends to stick on one side of the baseline, only having one baseline component. For arteries, we typically see monophasic flow in organs that need blood all the time, and so their waveform components stay above the baseline entirely. So then we have the parts of the spectral tracing as well. We kind of already touched on these as things that we can measure. But remember again, we have the peak systolic velocity, which is the fastest velocity that is recorded. We also have the end diastolic velocity, which is the lowest speed recorded right before the peak systolic starts. The acceleration time then is going to be the time from end diastolic to peak systolic. Lastly, then we can calculate the resistive index based on taking the peak systolic velocity, subtracting the end diastolic velocity, and dividing it all by the peak systolic velocity. Calculating the resistive index tells us more about the organ that is receiving that blood. We see low resistive waveforms are usually going to be monophasic and going to organs that constantly need blood like the brain or the liver. High resistive waveforms are typically going to be biphasic or triphasic, and we often see these high resistive waveforms in arteries that are headed towards limbs. Section 25.4, preparing for the SPI. Now you should double check with your school or institution for any site-specific guidelines for your SPI. You should also contact the ARDMS if you have any questions about how to apply or what prerequisite to use. As a disclaimer, I just want to say that I am not associated with any of these businesses except for this YouTube channel. These are my opinions and feedback that I've heard over the years. Everyone learns differently and has different needs as they prepare for their test but a lot of students find that it's very helpful to study from review material. In particular, review material that goes over questions or mock exams. There are multiple ways to access review material. You can perform an internet search to learn more. However, some of the more popular resources are going to include, of course, YouTube and Quizlet, which are gonna be more of your free options. And then you have larger companies like Davies Publishing, ESP Exxon, 
in the ultrasound registry review, which are all going to offer some sort of like click and learn or mock exam experiences. And then lastly, the ARDMS under the prepare tab also has a mock exam that you can purchase. I believe that it is about 30 questions for $35, but you get questions just like they're worded on the exam. No matter what study material you use, keep this one rule in mind. Recognition is not recall. Now, many students get super comfortable with taking the mock exams over and over again, and they think they understand or can recall a topic, but what they're really doing is just recognizing the question and what the exam told them the right answer is. So let me show you an example. Let's say you're in a class about dinosaurs and you've been learning about dinosaurs all semester. You should know what they eat, what they look like, where they lived, their sizes, all sorts of information about these dinosaurs. And you're looking through some review materials, some mock exams about dinosaurs, and this question comes up. What is the biggest dinosaur on record? And you're looking at your options and you're like, oh boy, I don't remember learning about this. Or maybe you're like, oh, you know, I can narrow it down between a few of these, but I'm not 100% sure. So you answer and you find out that it's the Dreadnoughtus. So Dreadnoughtus is the biggest dinosaur on record. You're like, awesome, that's great. Keep going through all of your mock exam questions. The next time this question comes up, chances are you're going to remember or recognize that Dreadnoughtus is the correct answer to the biggest dinosaur on record. Now, did you learn something? Absolutely. That's why mock exams are totally fine. But what happens when this isn't the question that you're asked on your final exam or on your board test? What if they ask you, what is the second biggest dinosaur on record? Because remember, you're supposed to know all about dinosaurs. You need to know this material. On one hand, great, you can rule out Dreadnoughtus because you might remember that Dreadnoughtus is the biggest dinosaur. But what you didn't do is go back and review how the Saltosaurus, Argentinosaurus, and the Patagotitan Maorium fit into the list of biggest dinosaurs. So when you are studying your mock exams, make sure that you are paying attention to what the correct answers are. Then go dissect the answers a little bit more. Why isn't it answer A or why isn't it answer B? What makes answer C the best answer? And so on. Really know the material. You'll really want to know why the correct answers are correct and why the wrong answers are wrong in the event that you get a variation on that question. So just for the fun of it, the second biggest dinosaur on record, according to the resources that I found, happens to be the Patagotitan Maorium. So you really want to use these mock exams as a way to assess where your studying is deficient so you can brush up on the areas that you need to and then skip the areas that you have mastered. So again, example, this would be a great one showing us, no, I really don't know the order of dinosaur sizes. I need to go study that some more. Had you done that from your first mock exam, you would probably then know what the second biggest dinosaur is. So another great way is to try teaching someone else a topic or write about a topic in your own words to see if you truly can recall the material or are you just remembering the answer to a particular question. A lot of students also benefit from going to some sort of review seminar. These are held either in person or online, and the cost of them varies from speaker to speaker. Uh, URR has an online class that you can go through. Tracy Fox has some wonderful videos. Dr. Edelman has his very famous ESP seminars that go over the weekend with the Red Book. Everybody loves the Red Book. Uh, my ultrasound tutor is very popular on Facebook, so is Exam Refresh. And of course, my stuff, which is on YouTube. Do you have to use any mock material or do you have to go to any review seminars? Absolutely not. But I do encourage people to think about if using these extra resources is going to give them the confidence boost that they need to feel confident to pass the SPI, then it is 100% worth your time, worth the cost, if you think it's going to help you. Not everybody feels like it's necessary. There's something definitely to be said about hearing material a second time from somebody else in different words. But again, remember going into these as review seminars, not something that's going to teach you everything again really quickly. The Tracy Fox, I believe, is like a six hour seminar. Edelman's is like a 12 hour seminar. So they're quick. If you've been watching all of my videos so far, you've been at this for hours and hours and hours. There's a lot of information about ultrasound physics. These review seminars are going to hit the highlights and hopefully get you 
the minimum information that you need to pass your boards. There are also review books out there if you have been using the textbooks and want something a little bit lighter to read. One of my favorite review books is the Penny Fox book. Uh, the link will take you to Amazon in the workbook. I'm not affiliated with that again at all. Uh, it is the same Tracy Fox that has the seminars and Stephen Penny who writes quite a few review books for ultrasound, highly recommended. In your workbook, I've also included a couple links for you to go to. So if you navigate to the ARDMS website, you can read all about the SPI. In fact, I will take you there now. We'll click on the ARDMS SPI and here you'll see tons of information about the SPI. I'm going to scroll down here. We have the overview, what all is in it. Um, each of these is a clickable tab for more information. Read through all of this. Go to requirements, read through all of this. The prerequisite prep tool. You can figure out which prerequisite you should apply under. But I wanna show you my favorite part of this whole thing is going under prepare, and this is linked in your workbook as well. Go to review the SBI content outline, and here's the very basic SBI content outline. Clinical safety, patient care, and quality assurance accounts for 10% of the questions. There are about 110 questions on the test, so that means you'll have 11 questions on all the content under this topic. Physics principles is about 15%, so you can expect 15 to 16 questions on physics principles. Ultrasound transducers, 16%, so you kind of get an idea of which topics are going to be heavily covered. But I want to take this a step further and I want you to click on the SBI content outline. And again, this is the link in your workbook. Once you click on that, this is going to bring you to a PDF of the outline in a much more detailed format. So again, we have our five topics, percentage of questions based on those topics. But as you scroll through this, it's going to tell you more details about what those topics cover. So for example, clinical safety, patient care, and quality assurance. That's kind of what this unit is part of. So we need to know about infection control precautions and disinfectant techniques. Well, we talked about that in unit 24. How to modify output power and following ALARA principles, bioeffects and ALARA, identifying potential bioeffects. So as we scroll through, you can see there's a lot more detail about the overarching categories and you can look at this and make sure that you're studying the correct information. Now, when I said earlier, try to teach somebody about a topic or write down everything you know about a topic, another suggestion for you is to go through each of these. For example, just pick one, evaluate applicable uses of ultrasound contrast agents. Take that topic, write down everything you know about it, revisit the book, see what items you miss, then add to your notes. Make notes based on these topics. If you know about frame rate, you know the formulas that go along with it, what increases it, what decreases frame rate, you should be good to go. Again, why do we use one and a half dimensional array transducers? What does it mean to have a one and a half dimensional array transducers? Go through each of these topics, write down everything you know about them, and then fill in the gaps that you need to make sure that you truly understand each of these topics so you're ready for your test. So again, the SPI outline is going to tell you exactly what to expect from the test, what topics could be covered, and what percentage each topic will hold. Now the whole test is about two hours long, and it's going to have about 110 multiple choice questions on it. So that means you get about 1.1 minute per question. So you need to know your material. A calculator is not necessary for the test, but a basic one may be provided by your testing site. It's gonna be a very basic calculator plus minus divide multiply. Now again, I just want to highlight that I do not represent the ARDMS and you should do your own research as to what prerequisites you fall under for taking the SPI or contact your physics instructor or the ARDMS for help on that. Now you do need to sign up for an ARDMS number if you don't already have one and then you register to take the test. You do need to provide documentation that shows you're eligible to sit for the SPI. Currently, it costs $225 for the exam. Your testing is either going to be done at a testing center or at your home. The home testing is a new thing since November of 2020. The home testing rules and requirements are pretty strict, so make sure that you review those rules and requirements before you choose that option. 
A score of 555 out of 700 is required to pass the SPI. And then once you've passed the SPI, you have five years to sit for a specialty exam to complete your registry. So again, if you want to be an ARDMS registered sonographer, you need to take the SPI plus a specialty registry. So that's going to be your adult echo, abdominal, OBGYN, vascular. Those are all specialty registries. Once you have your SPI done and any specialty registry, you will not need to take the SPI ever again. You really only need to take it once unless you fail to get a registry within that five-year window. If you don't pass a specialty exam within that five years, you will need to take the SPI again prior to attempting a specialty exam. So my last little bit of advice is to take the test sooner than later. If you're currently in school and have a semester break coming up, try to schedule your tests for that time. You most likely had to just study for a physics final and you should use that study time towards passing your SPI. Many students that I've talked to kind of regretted not taking it as soon as the class was done because this is all kind of easy stuff to forget. But don't go into the test just expecting to pass. You really do need to have a strong mastery of the topics and some people get that from a couple weeks of studying and some need more scanning and hands-on learning. So this is where a good mock test will really tell your preparedness and help you determine when you're ready. Remember, taking those mock tests over and over and over again only proves that you have the capability of recognition, not recall. So make sure that you are using those mock tests effectively to focus your studying on areas that you need. So I wish you nothing but good luck in all of your ultrasound adventures. I hope your hard work and tenacity plays off. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. Now go own that physics test so we can celebrate. I'd love to hear your success stories. And that is it, not only for Unit 25, but all of the ultrasound physics lectures. As far as Unit 25 goes, you may have noticed while we were scanning through the detailed SPI outline that it talked about needing to know about hybrid and fusion imaging. It talked about needing to know about IVIS ultrasound. It talked about needing to know about tissue Doppler. So really focus on some of those newer technologies just in case you get some questions about them on your boards. There are no activities for this unit. I did include a few nerd check questions at the end just to make sure that you understand the content.